Greetings, Pastor Sarah here for our fourth installment of What is the Bible? How is it used? How is it abused? Etc. So I'd like to start our discussion today with a few terms that are not named in the Bible, but people have developed as a result of improper use of the Bible. The first is the theology of glory. It is a belief that God is God for some and not for all. It classifies and gives status to some believers for earning God's favor. This is that icky feeling that you get when someone says something that feels like it's excluding you or others from receiving God's grace based on something you have or have not done, based on who you are or who you are not. Theology is the study of God. If the study of God's glory is a result of choices and actions of a person or group with no implication that God is actually responsible, you're dealing with a case of the theology of glory. The theology of glory uses words like choose and decide to accept with no regard for the power of the Holy Spirit to act in and through us. The theology of glory minimizes tragedy and abuse and states it had to happen because God needed another angel or that suffering will lead to a greater good. The theology of the cross, in comparison, gives all glory and honor to Christ who died for our sins and gave us the advocate to lead and guide us. And then who rose from the dead, defeating the power of death. The theology of the cross requires us to look through the lens of Jesus in reviewing all things. It gives glory to Christ, even when God's actions cannot be seen or seem weak or insignificant. Another term closely aligned with the theology of glory is works righteousness. It's the belief that people have the ability to earn their own salvation by the actions and efforts that they make, which they believe to be of their own power. An example would be if I said that I deserve to see my family in eternity because I've been such a good citizen and such a good Christian all my life. Being a good person is helpful in society and for yourself. However, God is the final judge and Jesus, who was God in human form, is the one who has done all of the work for us. So to look at someone and say they're not a good Christian and that they don't deserve to, to go to heaven is actually what is sinful. Cheap grace is another abuse of biblical writing. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, but it's a gift from God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. You could hang a, a great deal of Lutheran theology on this specific Bible verse. I'm not one to take uh, uh, just a part of the Bible out, but this one is really close to what Lutherans believe. Um, but it is also an example of the opposite of cheap grace. So cheap grace excuses bad behavior and uses God's grace to cover all. So cheap grace does not hold people accountable for their behaviors or lack of effort to help others as Jesus has taught us. Martin Luther is famous for saying many things, but one that people enjoy saying is sin boldly. That's what he had said. Sin boldly, but believe and rejoice in Christ even more boldly, for he is victorious over sin, death, and the world. People sin, and we all fall short of the glory of God, and sin can be forgiven. But God is the judge, and all choices have consequences. Grace is not a permission to kill, abuse, harm, or sin. Cheap grace is like the abuser syndrome. A person who is abusive asks for forgiveness. They're forgiven by the victim. They've shown grace, right? And then abuser abuses again. And the cycle just continues. Cheap grace does not consider the real harm that needs to be called out and dealt with for the betterment of humanity. In order to help unlearn and reprogram your brain from all that you have learned, maybe in the past, uh, in 
Sunday school or maybe in just an ev evangelical culture that we live in. It's helpful to read some books that allow us to look at the Bible in creative and thoughtful ways. So Peter Enns has some, some dry humor and an excellent book called How the Bible Actually Works. And I love the late Rachel Held Evans book, Inspired Slaying Dra Giants, Walking on Water, and Loving the Bible Again. And one that is helpful in working with youth, um, another book is Taking the Cross to Youth Ministry by Andrew Root. The Bible does not give us the answers. The Bible helps us formulate the questions. Reading the situation and using practical knowledge based on the life of Jesus allows the Bible to help us gain wisdom. The New Testament was a rewriting of God's relationship with the people after the time of the Old Testament. We are still doing that now. Each week, I am digging into the ancient texts and making it uh, relatable and relevant to today's world in our context. Wisdom comes through failure, mystery, trial and error, and it grows through time, just as the Bible grows along with us. We use the Bible to discover what attitude we bring to our life of faith and how we see God. We are co-creators with God. God's plan also lies in our hands. To know oneself is to gain wisdom into the world God created. And to know oneself is to be wise, which is what God wants for us. There are 1,300 years between the first and the last book written in the Bible. Clearly, times have changed during this amount of time. We have to hold the Bible in one hand and hold the newspaper in the other, meaning that we have to take into consideration our context and the time in which the Bible was written and now what's going on in our world today. When reading the Bible, one needs to read more than just the verses. But an introduction to each book, to the footnotes, in addition to varying interpretations and words that are used. A good Bible study is the New Interpreter's Study Bible, and the version of the Bible that the ELCA prefers to use and one that we read in church is the New Revised Standard Version. And we'll talk more about resources and how to use the Bible in a way that gives life in our last section, which will be next week. Peace be with you.